So it'd be remiss for me to talk about the Sahara without talking about Timbuktu. So this last section of my work focuses on that city. These are animals coming into the city at the end of the day, but one of the main reasons we went to Timbuktu was to look at the manuscripts. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Timbuktu manuscript situation, but in 2001, Thabo Mbeki, the president of South Africa, went to Timbuktu, and he, um, he was very excited to find what he called the written history of Africa. Now, in Timbuktu, you know, they are, you know, in Timbuktu and in the surrounding communities, there are hundreds of thousands of manuscripts that date back to the 14th century, the 11th century, etc. And they are, many of them are Quranic, but many of them are about medicine, they're about science, they're about astronomy, and they're about the history of what happened in that part of the world. But due to various revolutions, various uh, oppressions, various groups coming in and taking over, Various conflicts, most of these manuscripts have been kept in very bad condition, they've been hidden, they've been buried in the desert. But since 2001, there's been a real revival of that. So Timbuktu has become a more vibrant city as a result. Um, and there's a, there's a very earnest effort on the, on the part of people like the Ford Foundation and other foundations from all over Europe as well um, to harness this knowledge and to restore these manuscripts. Anyway, so let me show you a little bit of Timbuktu. This is actually a funeral scene. Um, a man has died, and this is the relatives coming out and paying respects. But it gives you some sense of what it looks like in the streets of Timbuktu. You know, it's a, it's a legendary city. And visually, I have to tell you, it doesn't really live up to that legend. But it's something to say. You know, it's being in Timbuktu. Tick. Thank you very much. You know? So interesting to see. <coughs> In Timbuktu, there's a big army base. And there's a big army base because there's been Al-Qaeda attacks within Timbuktu. One that we know about for sure, but we know that there is a presence in the region, and that is the main reason why there is an army base there. This is Mali Army Independence Day, so soldiers out celebrating in the street. It's also a city of mosques. You know, This is Jizingare Mosque. This is the largest mosque um, in Timbuktu. And, you know, I think it's the largest adobe mode structure in Africa, it's certainly the largest mosque, I think. But quite magical to think that these mosques have been here for as long as they have. And this is Songhai Mosque, and you know, the thing with Timbuktu is that it really is a traditional meeting point. It's, it's a nexus point for the Sahara. So you know, for centuries, um, people have met here, traded here, exchanged knowledge here. It was a point in Timbuktu's history where they had one of the finest universities in the world. You know, a lot of the knowledge that I talked about earlier in terms of the manuscripts, it's in these books. So it's very exciting. You know, I'm, I'm African, I'm South African, and you know, I'm used to traveling in Africa and hearing that history, the history of Africa is an oral tradition. This is a manifestation of that oral tradition. So the more that we work on preserving it, the more we might understand about Africa's true past. This is a 17th century manuscript talking about the tomb of the prophet in Mecca. So there's a lot of these beautifully illustrated but badly preserved manuscripts. This is a, uh, a modern-day philosopher. And you know what happened traditionally in Timbuktu is that these guys would come up the Niger River, or they'd come over, over the Sahara on camel train, um, and they'd come to the center of knowledge. And this guy now today is a modern-day philosopher. He runs one of the libraries that are trying to harness all these manuscripts. This is a calligraphy school, and you're seeing more and more of this. There's a, there's a real sense of pride in Timbuktu about education and about um, you know, the business opportunities behind the manuscripts. Again, the city of mosques. Yeah. So you see guys from Nigeria, you see guys from Ethiopia, you see people from all over Africa come through this place, just as they've done for the last 10 centuries. This is breaking the fast outside the Jingare Mosque. This is a 5 a.m. You know, session in, one, in a local man's house. So they'll come together and they'll pray, and then they'll have a discussion for an hour. And it's a discussion about the topics of the day. So again, just really an illustration of the fact that there's, this Timbuktu is very much viewed as a philosophical, scholarly city, and it's still viewed as that today. Just what the streets look like in the back, you know? Just lots of settlements around the outside of Timbuktu. Songhai woman just walking into a storm. One of the things about Timbuktu that's fascinating is there's three major cemeteries and the town is essentially built around these cemeteries. Um, and all those early explorers, those British guys, the French guys that came here and were killed um, or came here and survived to be buried, 
they are buried here. In this particular picture, you see a man who's lost his mother and um, receiving a blessing from an imam inside the, inside the cemetery. All these pots represent graves. Interesting as well, because you find a lot of young, of these young kids in Timbuktu, primarily boys, and uh, what's happening with them is that they've been dropped off for an education. So they'll come to the local marabou, who is kind of, um, he's a teacher, he's a, he'll talk to them about Islam, he'll talk to them about mysticism, he'll talk to them about um, a, system, a system of education, but he won't support them at all. So these kids will spend their days begging, um, for food, sleeping outside, etc., but they all go and see the marabou for an education. This is the marabou that, that Peter and I met. And in this case, a man who his family says is mentally unstable has been chained to this post in this room um, while a man, while the marabou drives the craziness out of him. And when we spoke to this man chained to the post, um, he said it was working. You know, his family said it was working. So one of the things that I found really interesting about this marabou, though, was that um, there's a colonel who was in charge of the so-called anti-terrorist unit in, um, in Timbuktu. Um, he was so successful that four members of Al-Qaeda came into Timbuktu, came into his house, and gunned him down. But it took them so long to kill him that the same members of Al-Qaeda Went to, this, went to this marabou and asked who made the gigris, who made the trinkets of invincibility that the colonel was wearing. And when they found out it was this guy, they made him a deal, and apparently this guy no longer lives in Timbuktu. He now lives back in Mauritania making gigris for Al-Qaeda. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Again, transport pictures, just typical street scenes in Timbuktu. Coming up on the Niger River these days, you come up the river, or you come you, you come overland on land cruises, or you come on the camel train. But commerce is conducted on the river, for the most part. There's quite a lot of Libyan influence in Timbuktu. In Timbuk this canal has been has been uh, reopened um, by Gaddafi. Um, there's a huge hotel that he's built in Timbuktu that's very close to this canal. So. It's interesting to see the financial influence of Bolivia across this whole region. Very vibrant street culture. This is at a wedding. These dancers are just having a good time. Flash floods in Timbuktu. It's not quite the place where you think that sort of thing would happen, but um, it does. And this is the local high school. This is the high school at 7.30 in the morning. Um, now, the thing with Timbuktu is it's still, you know, it's not fundamentalist, but it's still a religious place. Um, so what happens with the kids is there's no bars, there's no clubs, there's no place for self-expression. So they express themselves by dressing up to go to high school. So I saw kids going to the school that, it was kept there, that were as hip as any kids I've seen in LA. Thanks very much, guys. Cool.